welcome our soupy brethren. All, all are welcome here. Thank you so much to Ben for leading the raid over. Hello, Thanks, ben. Ev- hello everyone who's new. Hello everyone who has been here before. Before we dive in, let's just explain what we do here. First of all, hi, I'm Alistair, and eight feet to my left is the amazing Marguerite. Hello everyone. I'm in the chat with you tonight. She'll be in the chat with you tonight. I will be right here. <coughs> we do three things. You're the talent. I'm the one on. I'm right here. We'll leave it there for now. We do three things. Every night. The big one is we'll read you a piece of a story. Right now, it's a story by little-known indie cult author Charles Dickens, or as he insisted on people called him, Boz. Actual historical Documentary fact, proof. Though. Still not over it. Doubt I ever will be. Before that... And now we've had a second raid. Hello, calligrapher. Welcome. Calligrapher. Welcome aboard. Yes. Ah, uh, so, Boz... Fantastic. <clears throat> is best known, of course, for A Christmas Carol, the story of an absolute bastard being told he's an absolute bastard, and unusually for the rules of basic narrative drama going, oh shit, I am, aren't I? By the way, content warning swearing. Um, we're on stage four or five, so things have gone through the, uh, what was splendidly described as the party bear section last week to what we call cautionary wraith hours. We'll be getting there in a moment. Before that, however, there are two things which we need to go through. Firstly, an immense thank you to Topaz for the Chungus 2020 Winter Collection, which you saw as our opening fan art. My personal favourite, I think, is Chungus Among Us, but the Chungus Archangel outfit might just edge it. Zagreus. <laughs> you mean Chungrius. Oh, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce that word, and I think Wendy's quite taken with the Sugar Plum Fairy as well. So... The new people may be asking who Chungus is. Chungus is our sourdough starter. And um, Are you just going to go ahead and do this? I'm just going to dive right in. I'm okay. gonna, I'm just gonna Hold do on a second, folks. There's like... There's, there's, like the, there's actual lighting. Our sourdough time. starter has, ward, has wardrobe and lighting <sighs> now. Hang on a second. I'll be right there. Okay. There you go. See? Okay. Okay. Observe just the majesty that four rats in a trench coat has wrought unto us. But wait! Observe the lighting. Observe the spectral glow. I, in fact, I bought a black light oh. just to show you how that costume Look at this. Look at how amazing this is. Spooky and delicious. <coughs> yes, you <we're coughs> Yes, we do. We're going to have um, sourdough pancakes tomorrow, so I have to feed him yet. Cautionary rate. Yes, exactly. So, that's Chungus. Chungus is our sourdough starter. Uh, special thanks to Four Rats in the Trench Coat, and Topaz, and Wendy, and Chungus' ever-growing staff of costume designers for just making our boy look Good. I'm gonna have to buy little tiny hangers for little tiny costumes for little tiny yes. sourdough Yes, yeah, I kind of think you are. So that's Chungus. I've talked to you about the main part. Shenanigans, which is Magnus Arco's related stuff, will come at the end as a piece of brain sorbet. And we'll talk about what brain sorbet is after uh, we get done with Boz for the week. Um, but- hey, I just gotta jump in. Hey. Uh, Haven says, a and I love you both, but we have to admit that Chungus is the talent. And see, I think that's see, fair. See, I, this, is, the, this, this is why I'm always a bit kind of, no, 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 the, the, the talent is in the fridge, hon. Oh, well, there's a sentence. Let me clip that. The, the, ta- talent, the talent is, is in, in the, the fridge, fridge, hon. Okay. Wow. Wow, this, this has gone south fast. We're, it's going well. Um, We're going to have to start a wardrobe for him like the mannequin piss has. Okay. I don't get that reference to you. Uh, yes, I think I do, and yes, we do. Yeah, uh, it's 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 becoming necessary. The mini okay, rotary okay. functions. Okay, I, I I I draw the line at mannequins. I've played Silent Hill. The answer is no. <laughs> 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 uh, for now. Oh, it's a thing in Brussels. All right. Well, if there's any folks from Brussels who want to explain that, oh, the statue. Fabulous. Now I get the reference. Thank you all very much. Uh, no mannequins. Moving swiftly on. <laughs> no mannequins, darling. No mannequins, darling. No mannequins. So, here's what we're going to do. 
Um, much like you'd have trailers and adverts in the cinema in the before times, which will give you a chance to get situated and comfortable, we do an opening monologue every week. And this is a chance for you to get your stream snacks, get hydrated, take any meds you need, get comfy, make sure the correct doors are closed, you know, protective wards in place, all that good stuff. And, the bedroom um, door is closed. The cat boy is secure. Indeed. Uh, and a lot of the time across the course of this first year, uh, our opening monologue has been written by the fantastic Nate Crowley. Nate has an incredible book out called Notes from Small Planets, which is both a celebration of and just vicious and extremely justified attack on tropes in genre fiction. It's also very funny. And like everything Nate does, it's actually about three or four stories happening at once. We'll put a link to it in the show stream notes. And uh, I mention it here because Nate is not the provider of this week's opening monologue, but a colleague of his is. One of the other things Nate does is he writes for Rock Paper Shotgun, the PC gaming site. As does Alice Bell. And Alice, this week, produced one of my favorite bits of writing in a very, very long time. So, significant hydration. Before we get started, folks, don't forget, if you haven't got a drink or a snack, if you need to attend to medications or pets, if you haven't gotten up and stretched in a little while, because let's be honest, it's the run-up to Christmas and most of us are lying around playing video games and eating chocolate, but please do that before we, we get started, because you need to take good care of yourself. Yeah. Let's be honest. We all know who should have actually played Johnny in Cyberpunk 2077. By Alice Bell, Deputy Editor, 23rd December 2020. Let me preface this by saying that I, like everyone else, have an enormous amount of respect and affection for Keanu Reeves. By all accounts, he is just a very lovely man, and to different people he is Ted Theodore Logan. He is Neo, the Chosen One. Latterly, he is dog-loving murder machine John Wick. He has put in fabulous terms in some truly iconic productions, it's just that, with the best will in the world, his performance as Johnny Silverhand in Cyberpunk 2077 isn't really one of them. Keanu Reeves, he of the memes, was revealed in terms of his connection to the game, not, you know, as a person, at the same time as Cyberpunk's initial release date, back at E3 2019. He appeared on stage, seemed surprised that everyone was losing their minds at him and or some rinky-dink gamer majig, and someone in the crowd yelled, You're breathtaking! at him, and Keanu, God love him, yelled it right back. A now famous moment that is immortalised in the most fitting way. As opposed, in cyberpunk's photo mode. Keanu's involvement was just another ratchet in the quivering, breaking, breaking point excitement that a bunch of people already had for cyberpunk. But... As Graham noted in an aside in his review, Keanu's performance in the game is actually probably the weakest of the cast. This is not his fault. He plays Johnny Silverhand, erstwhile rock band frontman who planted a nuclear bomb in a corporation's headquarters, but got caught and turned into a data ghost now living in the Cyberpunk 2077 Protax head. Johnny Silverhand is, from what I can gather from the context in the game, an overconfident asshole, a loud revolutionary, a screaming rock star terrorist full of howling rage. In other words, the opposite of the thing that Keanu Reeves is good at portraying. Keanu was alright in the moments where Johnny's being quiet and introspective, but those moments are kind of few and far between. CDPR gave him a role that really doesn't play to his strengths. Add to this that voice acting in a game, even one with mocap, is a very different thing to acting in a movie or a TV show, and you end up with a pretty flat performance. Keanu is right for many things, but for this, he's like my dad trying to discuss why Brexit is still definitely going to be great. Self-evidently wrong. <laughs> this is a shame. This is a real shame. Because there already exists an actor who is perfect for the role of Johnny Silverhand. A screaming rock star terrorist? Howling rage. Who are you picturing? No. No, it is not the stoic grace of Keanu Reeves. It is a flailing disaster piece. It is the OG meme man. It is, of course, Mr. Nicolas Cage. Look at Nicolas Cage and tell me that instantly he doesn't make thousands of percentiles more sense. Nicolas Cage would be literally perfect for this. There is no role he has been in where he hasn't given it his all and subsisted entirely on a diet of the scenery. This wouldn't even be the first time Nick Cage has played a ghost driven by vengeance. 
I'm convinced that everything else would have played out exactly the same. The internet would have gone wild, if anything, even more so. It's Nicholas fucking Gage. Even the, you're breathtaking moment would have been the same. Like, of course, you can imagine Gage hooting, you're breathtaking, at a crowd. He probably just does that. He probably accosts random people on the street and says that to them on the daily. The only difference would have been that A, Cage is probably a bit less expensive by the hour than Keanu, and B, Cage doesn't have a line of motorbikes you'd end up having to put in your game. So, like, wins all around, I guess. The only explanation I can think of is that they asked Cage and he was already busy, talking carving intricate models of fast food out of bone or whatever it is Nick Cage does with Nick Cage's time. Because if they didn't ask Nick Cage, then every single person involved in the decision-making process around Johnny Silverhand is a fool of the highest order. He was right there. He was right there. As Compost Witch put it in the chat, subsisting entirely on a diet of scenery yes do you want to tell the chat what it is nick cage is actually doing right now oh my god i am giddy at the thought of this nicholas cage is uh as of january 5th presenting the history of swearing for netflix he appears to be doing this from an ancient looking library with one of those globes that's actually a drinking cabinet he has short hair he is wearing a suit his beard is immaculate. If you look very closely at the two promos they have released so far, he does not, at any point, blink. I or as far as I can tell, talk to another person. So this may have been him stroking his beard and thinking, what can I film in captivity? <laughs> well, I have my library, and I have my suit, and I enjoy swearing. Get John Netflix on the phone. I have an idea. I am I'm genuinely giddy at the thought of this. Uh, it is... Oh, shit, Bose is saying, y'all, I have that book, A Brief History of Swearing. And it's the first book I stamped with my lightness stamp. That's amazing. So it's your fault, then. <coughs> hmm. Uh, shit, Bose, I think you may have won 2021 already. Well done. Uh, I'm I'm absolutely giddy at the thought of this because this is the exact type of bullshit nonsense that I respond to so very well. So um, I don't, I'm, will, of course, be jamming all of this into my face and there will, of course, be opinions. Let's move on. What's new with Alistair this week? Did the book come out last week or this week? <laughs> what is time? Time has no meaning. Uh, your Doctor Who book came out last week. Yes, it did. So my Doctor Who book is still out. Um, and, uh, While Marguerite scrambles desperately for a link. Why don't you tell them about the book, honey? I'll tell them about the book. Thank you, Specky. Real quick, for those of you who are new, uh, I have written the 50th in a series called The Black Archive, which are academic deep dives into individual Doctor Who episodes. And they go all over the place. There's stuff from 13, there's stuff from 1, there's stuff from everything in between. And the one I ended up getting to do was Day of the Doctor, the 50th anniversary special from 2013. And it was very hard. Because Day of the Doctor... The end. Yes. <laughs> it was very hard, and I had to do lots of very clever thinking. And I think I wrote it all down. Um, because Day of the Doctor is not actually a story. It's like a framework that recontextualizes the entirety of the rest of the series. And I had a really, really hard time with it for a while. And then I had an awful lot of fun with it for far longer. And now it's out, and I am really looking forward to seeing how people find it and also hopefully writing another one because there are a couple of stories that I would very much like to get the opportunity to do that with. So it looks like the electronic version is available now. The paperback comes out tomorrow and mm -hmm. there's a combo where you could buy both yes. and get the digital one now and the physical one tomorrow. Yes, Haven, ooh, another one. <laughs> how many books are in your head right now? Do At the want moment, to answer that question? three. Um, there is the novel which I need to revise. There is the novel from NaNoWriMo a decade ago, which I'm starting to realize is good and does need to be rebuilt. And there's possibly another one of these. Hey, honey, can you do me a favor and say hi to Lewis in the chat? Apparently Hello, Lewis. Down. How are you doing? Good job, Lewis. Good job, Lewis. Right. Shall we? I do believe there's some bars to be on with. Bars is... 
Buzz is in the house, y'all. Good grief. <sighs> One note, real quick, before we dive in. Um, Boz doesn't believe in things like coherent pacing at this point in his career. So um, there is, it, there's no break this time. Normally we'll take a break like halfway through. This one's a little bit shorter, so we're just going to power through it. Okay, by a little bit shorter, this one's only 6,000 words, whereas the previous segments were eight. So this will be a good long stretch, folks. If you do need to get a refill or anything, um, don't forget the VOD is always going to be available. Go ahead and step away, take a moment. And in fact, uh, if Thank you for I all that, push Aldrich. the button, mm -hmm. there is a link for you in the chat to the playlist with all the segments. So if you've missed an installment and you want to go back and listen to it, or if you need to step away and re-listen to this later, that's where you can find it. Fantastic. Rain, all you missed was the opening monologue, uh, which is a really fun little piece about Cyberpunk 2077. And that will be on the VOD, so you're good to go. I know, I think everyone <coughs> in the chat's in love with using the name Boz to describe this. So. Well, mischief managed, most certainly. So, content warning for this episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ghosts, absolutely. Um, discussions of death, so there's nothing graphic. Um, and... As always. Accents. Accents. All right. Stave four. I'll, I'll, I'll do this all properly. A Christmas Carol by Charles Boz Dickens. I love how you take a sip of water after that. Like you're trying to, you know, wink at the camera and let them let you get away with that. The temptation to throw up finger guns right now is almost overwhelming. You're on video. It's it acceptable. Just put the water down. Okay. Sh shall we start again? Yes. All right. A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave four. The last of the spirits. The phantom slowly, gravely, silently approached. When it came near him, Scrooge bent down upon his knee, for in the very air through which this spirit moved, it seemed a scattered gloom and misery. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form, and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand. But for this it would have been difficult to detach its figure from the night, and separate it from the darkness by which it was surrounded. He felt that it was tall, stately when it came beside him, and that its mysterious presence filled him with a solemn dread. He knew no more, for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come, said Scrooge. The spirit answered not, but pointed onward with its hand. You are about to show me, shadows, the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us, Scrooge pursued. Is that so, spirit? The upper portion of the garment was contracted for an instant in its folds, as if the spirit had inclined its head. That was the only answer he received. Although well used to ghastly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him, and he found that he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment, as observing his condition and giving him time to recover. I'm trying to be spooky. But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It thrilled him with a vague uncertain horror. <laughs> <laughs> As Compost Witch has so eloquently put it, woo! It was very Powerpuff Girls, I admit. It turned out a little bit too Powerpuff Girls. Sorry, folks. But that's just another costume. Make a note. Okay. Anyway, although well used to ghostly company by this time, Scrooge feared the silent shape so much that his legs trembled beneath him and he found he could hardly stand when he prepared to follow it. The spirit paused a moment as, observing his condition, and giving him time to recover. 
But Scrooge was all the worse for this. It, it thrilled him with a vague, uncertain horror to know that behind the dusky shroud there were ghostly eyes fixed intently upon him, while he, though he stretched his own to the utmost, could see nothing but a spectral hand and one great heap of black. "'Ghost of the future!' he exclaimed. "'I fear you more than any spectre I have seen, "'but as I know your purpose is to do me good, "'and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, "'I am prepared to bear your company and do it with a thankful heart. "'Will you not speak to me?' "'It gave him no reply. "'The hand was pointed straight before them. "'Lead on!' said Scrooge. "'Lead on! The night is waning fast. "'It is precious time. I know. Lead on, spirit!' The phantom moved away as it had come towards him. Scrooge followed in the shadow of its dress, which bore him up, he thought, and carried him along. They scarcely seemed to enter the city, for the city rather seemed to spring up about them and encompass them of its own act, but there they were, in the heart of it, on the exchange amongst the merchants, who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and looked at their watches and trifled thoughtfully with their great cold seals and so forth, as Scrooge had often seen them do. The spirit stopped beside one little knot of businessmen, observing that the hand was pointed to them. Scrooge advanced to listen to their talk. Now, said a great fat man with a monstrous chin, now I don't much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? inquired another. Last night, I believe. Why, what was the matter with him? asked a third, taking a vast quantity of snuff out of a very large snuff box. Thought he'd never die. God knows, said the first with a yawn. What has he done with his money? asked a red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excrescence on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey cock. I haven't heard, said the man with the large chin, yawning again. Left it to his company, perhaps. Ugh, I'd left it to me, that's for sure. The pleasantry was received with a general general laugh. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, said the same speaker. For upon my life, I don't know of anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party, volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, observed the gentleman with the excrescence on his nose. But I must be fed if I make one. Another laugh. Well, I am the most disinterested among you after all. <sighs> Oh, said the first speaker, for I never wear black gloves and I never eat lunch, but I'll offer to go if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not at all sure that I wasn't his most particular friend, for we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Bye-bye. Speakers and listeners strolled away and mixed with other groups. Scrooge knew the men and looked towards the spirit for an explanation. The phantom glided onto a street. His finger pointed to two persons meeting. Scrooge listened again, thinking that the explanation might lie here. He knew these men also, perfectly. They were men of business, very wealthy, of great importance. He had made a point always of standing well in their esteem, in a business point of view, that is. Strictly in a business point of view. "'How are you?' said one. "'How are you?' returned the other. "'Well,' said the first, "'Old Scratch has got his own at last, hey?' "'So I am told,' returned the second. "'Cold, isn't it? "'Seasonable for Christmas time. "'You're not a skater, I suppose?' "'No, no. "'Something else to think of. "'Good morning.' "'Not another word. "'That was their meeting, their conversation. "'It is myself that time. I accept my punishment. Not another word. That was their meeting, their conversation, and their parting. Scrooge was at first inclined to be surprised that the spirit should attach importance to conversations, apparently so trivial. But feeling assured that they must have some hidden purpose, he set himself to consider what it was likely to be. They could scarcely be supposed to have any bearing on the death of Jacob, his old partner, for that was past, and this ghost province was future. Nor could he think of any one immediately connected with himself to whom he could apply them. But nothing doubting that, to whomsoever they applied, they had some latent moral for his own improvement. 
He resolved to treasure up every word he heard and everything he saw, and especially to observe the shadow of himself when it appeared. For he had an expectation that the conduct of his future self would give him the clue he missed, and would render the solution of these riddles easy. He looked about in that very place for his own image, but another man stood in his accustomed corner, and though the clock pointed... And though the clock pointed to his usual time of day for being there, he saw no likeness of himself among the multitudes that poured in through the porch. It gave him little surprise, however, for he had been revolving in his mind a change of life, and thought, and hoped, he saw his newborn resolutions carried out in this. Quiet and dark beside him stood the phantom, with its outstretched hand. When he roused himself from his thoughtful quest, he fancied from the turn of the hand and its situation in reference to himself that the unseen eyes were looking at him keenly. It made him shudder and feel very cold. They left the busy scene and went into an obscure part of the town where Scrooge had never penetrated before, though he recognised its situation and its bad repute. The ways were foul and narrow, the shops and houses wretched, the people half-naked, drunken, slipshod, ugly. Alleys and archways like so many cesspools disgorged their offences of smell and dirt and life upon the straggling streets, and the whole quarter reeked with crime, with filth and misery. And poverty, no doubt. Pause. Content warning. Capitalism. For in this den of infamous resort, there was a low-browed beetling shop. Below a penthouse roof were iron, old rags, bottles, bones, and greasy offal were bought. Upon the floor within were piled up heaps of rusty keys, nails, chains, hinges, files, scales, weights, and refuse iron of all kinds. Secrets that few would like to scrutinize were bred and hidden in mountains of unseemly rags, masses of corrupted fat, and sepulchres of bone. Sitting in among the wares he dealt in by a charcoal stove made of old bricks was a grey-haired rascal nearly seventy years of age who had screened himself from the cold air without by a frowsy curtaining of miscellaneous tatters hung upon a line and smoked his pipe in all the luxury of calm retirement. Scrooge and the Phantom came into the presence of this man, just as a woman with a heavy bundle slunk into the shop, but she had scarcely entered when another woman, similarly laden, came in too. And she was closely followed by a man in faded black, who was no less startled by the sight of them than they had been upon the recognition of each other. After a short period of blank astonishment in which the old man with the pipe had joined them, they all three burst into a laugh. Oh, oh my, let the charwoman alone to be the first, cried she who had entered first. Let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe, here's a chance, if we haven't all three met here without meaning it. Couldn't have met at a better place, said old Joe, removing his pipe from his mouth. Come into the parlour, you were made free of it long ago, you know. The other two ain't strangers. Shut the, stop till I shut the door of the shop. Oh, how it squeaks. Ain't such a rusty bit of metal in the place as his own hinges, I believe. I'm sure there's such old bones here as mine. <laughs> oh, oh. We're all suitable to our calling. We're all well matched. Come into the parlour. Into the parlour. The parlour was the space behind the screen of rags. The old man raked the fire together with an old stair rod, and having trimmed his smoky lamp, for it was night, with the stem of his pipe put it in his mouth again. When he did this, the woman who had already spoken threw her bundle on the floor and sat down in a flaunting manner on a stool, crossing her elbows on her knees and looking with a bold defiance at the other two. "'What odds, then? What odds, Mrs. Dibber?' said the woman. "'Every person has a right to take care of themselves. He always did.' "'That's true indeed,' said the laundress. "'No man more so.' Well, then, don't stand staring as if you was afraid, woman. Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. No, indeed, said Mrs. Dibber and the man together. We should hope not. Very well, then, cried the woman. That's enough. Now, 
Who's the worst for the loss of a few fingers like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> no, indeed, said Mrs. Dibber, laughing. If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, a wicked old screw, pursued the woman, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone, by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke, said Mrs. Dibber. It's judgment on him. Wish it was a little heavier, replied the woman. It should have been. You may depend on it. Could lay my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe. Let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. Not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. But the gallantry of her friends would not allow of this, and the man in faded black, mounting the preach first, produced his plunder. It was not extensive. A seal or two, a pencil case, pair of sleeve buttons, brooch of no great value were all. They were severally examined and appraised by old Joe, who chalked the sums he was disposed to give up for each upon the wall, and added them into a total when he found there was nothing more to come. That's your account said Joe, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Mrs. Dibber was next. Sheets and towels, a little wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, one pair sugar tongs, and a few boots. Her account was stated on the wall in the same manner. <laughs> oh, I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine. It's the way I ruined myself, said old Joe. That's your account. If you ask me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. Now undo my bundle, Joe, said the first woman. Joe went down on his knees for the greater convenience of opening it, and having unfastened a great many knots, dragged out a large and heavy roll of some dark stuff. <coughs> What do you call this? said Joe. Bed curtains. Ah! returned the woman, laughing and leaning forward on her crossed arms. Bed curtains! You don't mean to say you took them down? Rings and all with him lying there, said Joe. Yeah, I do, replied the woman. Why not? You were born to make your fortune, said Joe. She'll certainly do it. Certainly shut all my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching out. For the sake of a man such as he was, I promise you, Joe, replied the woman. I would, it's a horrible line. I fell all over it. I'll, come, I'll back out, come back in. <coughs> I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe, returned the woman coolly. Don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? asked Joe. Who else do you think? replied the woman. He isn't likely to take cold without him, I dare say. Hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? said J old Joe, stopping in his work and looking up. Don't you be afraid of that, returned the woman. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting, Hobbit? asked old Joe. Putting it on him to be buried in replied the woman with a laugh. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, it ain't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. Can't look uglier than he did in that one. Scrooge listened to this dialogue in horror. As they sat grouped about their spoil in the scanty light afforded by the old man's light, he viewed them with a... With, <coughs> pardon me. He viewed them with a detestation and disgust, which could hardly have been greater, though they had been obscene demons, marketing the corpse itself. Ah, laughed that same woman when old Joe produced a flannel bag with money in it, told out their several gains upon the ground. This is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive, to profit us when he was dead. Ah, <laughs> Spirit said Scrooge, shuddering from head to foot. I see, I see, I see the case of this unhappy man might, might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? He recoiled in terror, for the scene had changed. And now he almost touched a bed, a bare, uncurtained bed, on which, beneath a ragged sheet, there lay a something covered up, which, though it was dumb 
announced itself in awful language. The room was very dark, too dark to be observed with any accuracy, though Scrooge glanced round it in obedience to a secret impulse, anxious to know what kind of room it was. A pale light rising in the outer air fell straight upon the bed and on it plundered and bereft, unwatched, unwept, uncared for, was the body of this man. Scrooge glanced towards the phantom. Its steady hand was pointed to the head. The cover was so carelessly adjusted that the slightest raising of it, the motion of a finger upon Scrooge's part, would have disclosed the face. He thought of it, felt how easy it would be to do, longed to do it, but had no more power to withdraw the veil than to dismiss the spectre at his side. Oh, cold, cold, rigid, dreadful death, set up thine altar here and dress it with such terrors as thou hast at thy command, for this is thy dominion. But of the loved, revered, and honoured head, thou canst not turn one hair to thy dread purposes, or make one feature odious. It is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, but that the hand was open, generous and true, the heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deed springing from the wound to sow the world with life immortal. No voice pronounced these words in Scrooge's ears, and yet he heard them when he looked upon the bed. He thought, if this man could be raised up now, what would be his foremost thoughts? Avarice, hard-dealing, griping cares, they have brought him to a rich end cruelly. He lay in the dark, empty house, with not a man, a woman, or a child, to say that he was kind to me in this or that, and for the memory of one kind word I will be kind to him. A cat was tearing at the door, and there was the sound of gnawing rats beneath the hearthstone. What they wanted in the room of death, and why they were so restless and disturbed, Scrooge did not dare to think. Spirit, he said, this is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me, please, please let us go. Still, the ghost pointed with an unmoved finger to the head. I understand you, Scrooge returned, and I would do it if I could, but I have not the power, spirit, I have not the power. Again, it seemed to look upon him. If there is any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, said Scrooge, quite agonized, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. <coughs> the phantom spread its dark robe before him for a moment like a wing, and withdrawing it revealed a room by daylight where a mother and her children were. She was expecting someone, and with anxious eagerness, for she walked up and down the room, started at every sound, looked out from the window, glanced at the clock, tried but in vain to work with her needle, and could hardly hear the voices of the children at play. A length, a long-expected knock was heard. She hurried to the door and met her husband, a man whose face was careworn and depressed, though he was young. There was a remarkable expression in it now, a kind of serious delight, of which he felt ashamed and which he struggled to repress. He sat down to the dinner that had been hoarding for him by the fire, when she asked him faintly what news, which was not until after a long silence, he appeared embarrassed how to answer. Is it good, she said, or bad, to help him? Bad, he answered. We are quite ruined. No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, she said, amazed, there is. Nothing is past hope. If such a miracle has happened, he is past relenting, said her husband. He is dead. She was a mild and patient creature if her face spoke truth, but she was thankful in her soul to hear it, and she said so with clasped hands, 
She prayed forgiveness the next moment and was sorry. But the first was the emotion of her heart. What the half-drunken woman whom I told you of last night said to me when I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay and what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, he was dying, man. To whom will our debt be transferred? I, I don't know. But before that time, we shall be ready with the money. And even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor in his successor. We may sleep tonight, Caroline, with light hearts. Yes, soften as it would, their hearts were lighter. The children's faces, hushed and clustered around, to hear what they so little understood, were brighter. It was a happier house for this man's death. The only emotion that the ghost could show him, caused by the event, was one of pleasure. Let me see some tenderness connected with the death, said Scrooge, or that dark chamber spirit which we left just now will forever be present to me. The ghost conducted him through several streets familiar to his feet, and as they went along, Scrooge looked here and there to find himself, but nowhere was he to be seen. They entered poor Bob Cratchit's house, the dwelling he had visited before, and found the mother and the children seated around the fire. Quiet. Very quiet. The noisy little Cratchits were all as still as statues in one corner, and sat looking up at Peter, who had a book before him. The mother and her daughters were engaged in sewing, but surely they were quiet. And he took a child and sat him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? He had not dreamed them. The boy must have read them out, as he and the spirit crossed the threshold. Why, why did he not go on? The mother laid her work upon the table and put her hand up to her face. The colour hurts my eyes, she said. The colour... Oh. Oh, poor tiny Tim. They're better now again, said Cratchit's wife. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home, for the world it must be near his time. Past it, rather, Peter answered, shutting up his book. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used these last few evenings, mother. They were very quiet again, and at last she said, and in a steady, cheerful voice that only faltered once, I have known him to walk with, I've, I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast indeed. So have I, cried Peter, often, and so have I, exclaimed another. So I will. But he was so very light to carry, she resumed, intent upon her work, and his father loved him so, though it was no trouble, no tr uh, there is your father at the door. She hurried out to meet him, and little Bob in his comforter, he had need of it, poor fellow, came in. His tea was ready for him on the hob, and they all tried who should help him to it the most. Then the two young Cratchits got upon his knees and laid each child a little cheek against his face, as if they said, don't mind it, father, don't be grieved. Bob was very cheerful with them, and spoke pleasantly to all the family. He looked at the work upon the table. He praised the industry and speed of Mrs. Cratchit and the girls. They will be done long before Sunday, he said. Sunday? You went today then, Robert, said his wife. Yes, my dear, returned Bob. I wish you could have gone. It would have done you good to see how, how green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him I would walk there on a Sunday. My little child. My little child. He broke down all at once. Couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been farther apart, perhaps, than they were. He left the room, went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child. And there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and when he thought he had a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again, 
quite happy. They drew about the fire and talked, the girls and mother working still. Bob told them of the extraordinary kindness of Mr. Scrooge's nephew, whom he had scarcely seen but once, and who, meeting him in the street that day and seeing that he looked uh, just a, just a little down, you know, said Bob, inquired what had happened to distress him. On which, said Bob, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever read. I told him, I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how he ever knew that, I don't know. You what, my dear? Why, that you are a good wife, replied Bob. Everybody knows that, said Peter. Very well observed, my boy, cried Bob. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, he said, giving me his card, that's where I live. Pray come to me. Now, it wasn't, cried Bob, for the sake of anything, he might be able to do for us, so much as for his kind way, that this was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our Tim. Felt with us. I'm sure he's a good soul, said Mrs. Cratchit. You would be surer of it, my dear, if you saw her and spoke to him. I shouldn't be at all surprised. Mark what I say if he got Peter a better situation. Only hear that, Peter, said Mrs. Cratchit. And then, cried one of the girls, Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you, Peter retorted, grinning. It's just as likely as not, said Bob. One of these days, though, there's plenty of time for that, my dear. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor Tim, shall we? Or this first parting that there was among us. Never, father, cried they all. And I know, said Bob, I know, my dears, that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, though he was a little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves. And forget poor tiny Tim in doing it. No, never, father, they all cried again. I am very happy, said Bob. I am very happy. Mrs. Cratchit kissed him, his daughters kissed him, the two young Cratchits kissed him, and Peter and himself shook hands. Spirit of Tiny Tim, that childish essence was from God. Spectre, said Scrooge, something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. I know it, but I know not how. Tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. The ghost of Christmas yet to come conveyed him as before. Though at a different time, he thought. Indeed, there seemed no order in these latter visions, save that they were in the future, into the resorts of businessmen, but showed him not himself. Indeed, the spirit did not stay for anything, but went straight on, as to the end just now desired, until besought by Scrooge to tarry for a moment. This court, said Scrooge, through which we hurry now is where my place of occupation is, and has been for a length of time. I see the house, let me behold what I shall be in days to come. The spirit stopped. The hand was pointed elsewhere. The, 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 the house is yonder. Scrooge exclaimed, why, why do you point away? The inexorable finger underwent no change. Scrooge hastened to the window of his office and looked in. It was an office still, but not his. The furniture was not the same, and the figure in the chair was not himself. The phantom pointed, as before. He joined it once again, and wonder, wondering why and whither he had gone, accompanied it until he had reached an iron gate. He paused to look round before entering. <coughs> Pardon me. A churchyard. Here then the wretched man whose name he had now to learn lay underneath the ground. It was a worthy place, walled in by houses, overrun by grass and weeds, the growth of vegetation's death, not life choked up with too much burying, fat with repleted appetite. A worthy place. The spirit stood among the graves and pointed down to one. He advanced towards it, trembling. The phantom was exactly as it had been, but he dreaded that he saw new meaning in its solemn shape. Before I draw nearer to that stone to which you point, said Scrooge, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they shadows of things that may be only? Still the ghost pointed downward to the grave by which it stood. Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead, 
said Scrooge. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. The spirit was immovable as ever. Scrooge crept towards it, trembling as he went, and following the finger, read upon the stone of the neglected grave his own name. <laughs> Ebenezer Scrooge. Am I that man who lay upon the bed? He cried upon his knees. The finger pointed from the grave to him and back again. No, no, spirit, no, no! The spirit was still there. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me, I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been, but for this intercourse, why show me this if I am past all hope? For the first time, the hand appeared to shake. Good spirit, he pursued as down upon the ground he fell before it. Your nature intercedes from me. It pities me. Assure me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. The kind hand trembled. I will honour Christmas in my heart. I keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. In his agony, he caught the spectral hand. It sought to free itself, but he was strong in his entreaty and detained it. The spirit, stronger yet, repulsed him. Holding up his hands in a last prayer to have his fate reversed, he saw an alteration in the phantom's hood and dress. It shrunk, collapsed, and dwindled down into a bedpost. End of state. It's kind of... <coughs> It's a pretty nice girl tiger, really. It's that's one of the best bits. Do you need a hug? Oh, I'm I'm good. I'm good. Okay, okay. It was totes and mosh. Totes and mosh, dude. It is totes and mosh. But I, I love how the ghost is not having any of his shit, <laughs> and everybody's like, w "Would Scrooge please get a clue by four? I I I just didn't you recognize any of your stuff being hawked there? I I it, it's it's weird. It reminds me of different things every time I come across this story. But for for those of you who have have seen Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back, buckle up. We're we're going on a journey. Um, All right, you go on a journey. I'm going to make you another cup of tea before shenanigans. The, the, there there is a moment where uh, the monkey they're looking after is kidnapped, and Silent Bob tries to describe what has happened to Jay, and does this through a series of elaborate mimes, and and Jay just absolutely cooks off at him. Um, for just never saying things properly or saying things straight. And Bob just grabs him by the lapels, yanks him towards him and goes, The sign at the back of the car! And it just gives him this very, very detailed breakdown of everything that he saw and just storms out of shot with this kind of... And I, I feel for the ghost of Christmas future, I really do, because just... It isn't me points whose grave is that points can i see my office points i want chips can i have chips points i'm bored get points. in the grave get in the grave can i have a nintendo switch points just you know i, I i'm gonna have this image of, of the, the ghost just going oh fuck's sake Or just you know meeting up in the break room with the ghost of Christmas present. Yeah. Well? <clears throat> Pardon me. I yeah. find your lack of cheer disturbing. You'll have to say that a little <coughs> Just you know meeting up with the, the ghost of Christmas present in the break room. And it's like, so how did it go? Oh great! I showed him all the food and told him the importance of love and all that. How about you? He's a dumbass. Pointed at the, at the grave like 15 times. What the hell is wrong with this guy? I mean, seriously. Right. Yeah, I'm just. Uh, <coughs> this is really hot, so be careful. Thank you. Finish that one. Yes, Jax, the, the, the image that you just put in, in the thread, that is exactly the image that I see under the cowl. Just that going. Really, white boy? Really? 
You know what I think this calls for? What does this call for? I think it might be time to lighten the mood. Let's talk about brainstorm babe real quick. We actually started doing shenanigans because when we first started off doing this, we did mostly horror because I'm mostly horror, you know? <clears throat> and in particular, there's a superb set of, of short stories, always Alex approved, um, called Search and Rescue about the increasingly mutable reality in America's wild spaces and predatory staircases that appear at random. Trust me, track them down, they're amazing. But these things are also... Let me get you a link, chat. There's a playlist of them. Abjectly terrifying. And we were doing these late at night. So, um, yeah. Uh, we started doing shenanigans on the end because otherwise it'd be like, and then the only thing they found were her lungs, which were full of water, even though she was in the desert. Her head appeared inside a small child a hundred miles away. And and like, bye, sleep well, everybody. Like, no. So, so shenanigans are... <laughs> shenanigans are usually Magnus Archives related small pieces of fan fiction or poetry or comics or artwork. Uh, and we have one um, Magnus Archives and one non-Magnus Archives tonight. <laughs> Should we maybe pause here for just a moment if people need to get up and get a beverage real quick? Actually, that's a really good idea. Sh should we go away for a few minutes? Oh, no. I think everybody wants the shenanigans. Sorry, honey, you're stuck. All right, that's cool. <laughs> Perform for us, please. <laughs> that made-up creepy noodle was perfect. Here we go. Okay. So uh, this is by Compost Witch. Oops, hold on. I pushed the wrong button. I'm trying to find the shenanigans button. Hold on. There we go. Uh, and is a pair of bread lake poems, which may sound familiar. Chapter one, four bread licks for Bob. My name is Bob, my foamy head, helps Tabitha make famous bread. Then Mona made me live and grow, so eagerly I raised the dough. My name is Bob, when snow is deep, my family cannot me keep. I'm hungry, so become like cats. My bucket move, dissolve the rats. Some evil guy is doing stabs, and wizards flee, his power grabs. Let Mona run as fast as she can, to save her I lick spring green man. Who the is, in fact, come a poop. Say, say what? Who is, in fact, a poop. Oh, wait, that was Oberon. That's, uh, Lord Oberon is, in fact, a poop. The Carracks come to sack our town, make Mona sad. So I feel down, put me in jars, add them to throw. So acidly, I lick the foe. Chapter 2, and two bread licks for Chungus. I am a yeasty Chungus blob, the chat is shipping, me with Bob. When flour and waters freely flow, my foamy daughters raise the dough. My name is Chungus, true to tell, costume a Wendy, dress me well. As Christmas spirit, lonely peat, or ocean's mushroom, cosplay sweet. I love these. They're super cute, and I messed up the link, so hold on just a second, chat, and I'll get you the correct one. Uh, thank you for reminding us, Eldritch, that uh, the Spring Green Man was a fart, and Oberon was a poop. That is correct. It's an important to get the taxonomy correct yes. of bad guys. Taxonomy of evil. Yeah. Oh, that's a good name. I'm going to remember that. Here we go, chat. Here's the search and rescue collection again. And now taxonomy of evil with baby, I want your love thing. There's more search and rescue out there, isn't there? We found There's a bunch about four of or five more, yeah. Associated ephemera. We might have to consider coming back to those on one of the days where we have a break. Yeah, I th I thought yeet would have been worked in as well, Jax, but um, I I trust compost witch. I think they're still in the middle of composing. It does say chapters one and two, so I anticipate many more bread licks in our future. And now for something literally completely different. Uh, this comes from the Am I the Asshole Reddit, uh, a subreddit, and the Twitter account that retweets the best elements of these. <laughs> Am I the asshole for throwing away my husband's couch? He's pretending to be a beetle and it's driving me nuts. Backstory, my 33F husband, 35M, is a successful actor in film and theatre. He's very good. He's been in some minor roles in film with some A-list actors and very seriously dedicated to his craft. 
He is a firm believer in method acting, meaning he tries to truly live his role in order to understand it. Because of COVID, he basically hasn't had any work this year, and that's been really stressful on us both. A few weeks back, he got the main part in a play by a major theatre director, and so he's over the moon to be not just learning lines again, but working with the greats. He's taking this opportunity extremely seriously. The play is The Metamorphosis, about a German man waking up one day and finding out he has become a monstrous bug, a huge beetle. My husband has the man-beetle part. For his method acting, he strapped a big thing of cardboard to his back, like six by four feet, to give him the immo immobility of a big flat bug. He spends all this time on the floor, scurrying around and hissing and snarling and clicking to communicate. During work hours only. This isn't really a problem for me, because we have enough space in our 1BR apartment. The real issue is that since bugs are sensitive to light, he spends most of the day hiding under the couch, sleeping and snarling. This sucks because the couch is the only place in our apartment where I can sit to do work for my company during the day. I don't have a desk, but it's also the only place where he can conveniently lie flat and hide. Our bed frame doesn't have space underneath. This was going on for the last week. I kept tripping over his cardboard shell when I walked past the couch, and his sub-couch noises would disrupt me while I'm doing work. So I kind of lost it while he was sleeping in bed and threw out the couch. I replaced it with a nice big desk and chair from Ikea that I can work on, and he couldn't hide under. This gets to the am I the asshole question. He is now complaining that I threw out his couch, true, that nowhere else in the apartment is quite as good for being a bug, I'm not sure, and that me sabotaging his ability to be bug-like is compromising our finances. Not really true, I make more money than he does. He has a point on that, throwing out his couch might have been over the line. But there wasn't really a good spot for my work desk anywhere else in the apartment, and frankly the bug under the couch thing was driving me nuts. His method acting still seems to be going fine, he's now spending most of his days under a blanket fort in our bedroom, so no permanent damage appears to have been done, other than the couch, which kind of needed to be replaced anyway. <coughs> I feel like we need the John Mulaney, now we don't have time to unpack all that. Yes. <laughs> kind of response to this. The, uh, every time a capture comes up, I, 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 I just, and I, I hear him go, the numbers so far you've successfully guessed, but are you ready for the robot test? Okay, Sir Polly is, is adorable, Jax. And okay, this is a true story. My sister's name is Beth, and her nickname for a while was Bug. And she got this nickname because she fell asleep on the floor at my apartment once and had pulled the beanbag chair over her mm -hmm. like a ladybug. <laughs> and so we just started calling her Bug as a result, which is an amusing anecdote, but not at all relevant to this Literally Kafka-inspired, Kafka-esque nightmare. Just hide behind the fridge, you coward. Right. Pull out the washing machine and get behind it. You know, there are closet floors. Jeez. Rude. Rude. So, yes, he is the asshole. Yes, he is. That, and the day was saved. The end. By and, Jason Mendoza. <laughs> and, yeah, that is, in fact, the end of the show, folks. Um... We have, we've done Christmas Carol, we've done some open, some shenanigans, we had our opening monologue. Uh, you can next find us online this coming Sunday. Is, is, that, it, a, is it, that a question or is that a it, fact? Is it a calendarically significant date? Oh, I, I can't. what is time? Hang on, let me look. Time has no meaning. I'm trying to remember. It, it's still one of the days where I can sit on the couch and play f Fire Emblem for 12 hours and eat chocolate, right? Which is what's going to happen as soon as we sign off, by the way. I might put some cookies in the oven first and then... It's an explore day, so I have to oh, go see what fishing-related events are. Oh, fire. Ah, sorry. Details. Sunday is the 27th, so yes, we will be playing cool. The Last Campfire. <laughs> on, so on Sunday, please join us for hours 7 through 8 of the five and a half hour game. Yeah, see, here's the thing, folks. When you, when you take a game and you know how it has like an estimated completion time, you can at least double that for us. Because, well, well, in the stream's case, it's because we're chatting. In my particular case, it is because I am a completist. <laughs> 
So f needless to say, Fire Emblem Three Kingdoms, or Three Houses, or whatever the heck it is. There's the deer and the eagle and the, I think there's lions. I and devil. And, and I, I'm, I'm having fun with it. Okay. It, it, it's like the ultimate in fantasy busy work. I feel very accomplished by delivering my lessons and like getting people to ride horses. And, and then every once in a while, there's a little combat. And then the and then thing goes on. It feels very fulfilling. It is because I am a lawyer. That is right, Jax. Um, which, oh gosh, excuse me. I appear to have hijacked the chat for a moment. I am playing Golden Deer. This is my first playthrough. I've never played this game before. And oh my God, Klaus is adorable. Um, and so is Raphael. He's so sweet. I like him a lot. And apparently the point of the game is to recruit everybody into your house. But how does that make sense? Because you can't possibly teach three houses worth of students. I don't quite understand that part yet. There's just all these things that have been lost that need to be returned to people and choir practice. And, and, then, and then every once in a while you fight. And it's, it's very enjoyable. <laughs> it kept me very entertained on Solstice. I liked it. You may proceed, sir. I may proceed, sir. Very well. <laughs> My apologies. So, you have nothing to apologize for. So check in with us on Sunday for the next part of Lost Campfire. And then circle back around next Wednesday for uh, the moment where, at long last, having leapt into the body of Ebenezer Scrooge, Sam is finally able to put right what once went wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll also have a lot of shenanigans that week because the end of it is basically Scrooge going, oh, I have fucked all the way up. I'm so very sorry. Please have a large goose and some money. And um, it doesn't take terribly long. Exactly. So there have been a whole bunch of adorable Martin and Peter comics that, and one-off comics that people have made and sent to us. Please continue sending them to us because next week will be the 30th. It's the last stream of the year, and we're going to do a whole bunch of shenanigans and fun stuff. Martin, Martin, what's shit posting? Is it? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that, basically. That's what we're going to do next week. So come, <coughs> come prepared with your shenanigans, and we will have a nice relaxing time and also finish A Christmas Carol. Yes. Thank you all so much for listening. Oh, uh, tell folks about the show notes. Yes. Um, immediately after this, there will be... Uh, a big old bunch of show notes, which is going to be uh, details of the fan art and the shenanigans and some interesting Christmas Carol type stuff. Uh, I actually found some really, really good um, out of copyright YouTube videos of the earliest film adaptation oh. of it. There's got to be a million stage adaptations. And I know that uh, didn't your friend Chris Brasnahan do a live thing? He has. Yeah. This year. Oh, I, I have a couple of friends who've done this as, as, in a, as a wide variety of Christmas traditions. Chris has done it. Uh, my friend Wit, who is the palest human being in Texas uh, via Lancashire, does a regular one-man show of it. Um, Compost, which to answer your question, what is the best slash official way to send you shenanigans is uh, DM me on Twitter, please. That's where we spend most of the time, though I'm also on Discord. Mm -hmm. Most of you know me there. Um, and I try to check Discord at least once a day. But it, it, it is the season of playing video games for 12 hours and sitting on the couch. So I'm trying to get out of the office and not spend as much time in front of my computer. But, you know, Twitter is embedded into it's, it's my there. skin like everyone else. Oh, and Bridgerton. That is my entire plan for the 25th. I'm going to roast a gigantic piece of beef. Which we bought today, and is huge. It is huge. I'm going to make a cookie <coughs> cream pie. I might actually do that tomorrow. And I'm going to watch all of Bridgerton. All. Just hook the romantic Victoriana nonsense straight into my veins. Thank you. That sounds lovely. And because Fire Emblem was on the Switch, so I can do both at once. Mic drop. I Merry love Christmas! Her That's so my point. Much. I love her so very, very much. I love you too. Um, yes, we are roasting a beast. There will be a roasted beast for Christmas. Fantastic. Why? Because I'm American. You might be able to tell. So we had a turkey last month for Thanksgiving. So we tend to do something else for Christmas. And we bought both a giant roast beast and a little tiny ham. A little tiny baby ham. So we might have roast beast on Christmas and then ham in the after. In, in the period of the year where time has no meaning. The refrigerator is full of food, but I can't eat any of it yet. It's just very strange, and I'm sure there's a very long German word for it somewhere. Cheese. A little bit more cheese. Oop, too much no, cheese. No more cheese. 
Oh, a little more cheese. A little more cheese, yes. Otherwise known in this household as <clears throat> the adoration of the baby cheeses. <laughs> it's so tasty. <laughs> Thank you, folks, and and th- thank you so much. Yes, for Becky. Just... Ham. Ham. Have never had goose, Ozzy. I've had duck, but I've never had goose, and I have. No I've had kangaroo. Just... Say what? I've had kangaroo. You've had kangaroo. I've had kangaroo. I've had kangaroo as well, but what does that have to do with Christmas? Was that alligator? So have I. I've had rattlesnake, ostrich. Rattlesnake, chewy. I feel like it would be chewy. It's chewy chicken, basically. Yeah, okay. No, the alligator was the worst. It's like chicken that tastes like fish. It, eh, it's not my thing. Rue was good. Uh, buffalo was very good. I had a fantastic buffalo stew in San Francisco, right next to the zoo, which was kind of suspicious now that I think mm, about it. That's a, on that potentially disturbing note. <laughs> okay, everybody. Thank Sorry you so for, much, folks. For a bit of the wonder. We'll see you. On Sunday, we hope yep. have a wonderful holiday for those of you who happy, celebrate. Yeah, happy festive season, everybody. Please, everybody, take some good downtime and rest and stay safe. Yes. <laughs> stay safe. Especially that last bit. And we'll chat to you all around. Thanks so much.